Welcome to the Unstoppable CEO Podcast with Steve Gordon. Welcome to the Unstoppable CEO Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Gordon, and in today's episode, we're talking with Jonathan Cronstedt. Jonathan, or Jay Cron, to those who are close to him, is, as he says, a dangerously dedicated executive strategist. And when he's not driving outcomes for industry-leading brands or launching products online, he's blessed to be married to his wife, Nicole, who enjoys a, I guess, Jonathan, this is probably you, enjoying the freezer, freezer full of fabulous vodka. We'll have to compare notes later. And a puppy named Stella. And uh, so Jonathan has been working with the top digital marketing and SaaS companies. Uh, he's currently the pres- president of Kajabi. Um, and uh, they've just got a fabulous platform for uh, knowledge commerce, for for hosting courses and training and things like that. We're actually a customer. And so Jonathan, really happy to have you here. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you so much, Steve. And thank you for the incredibly uh, warm intro. I would welcome comparing vodka notes. It's uh, one of my favorite, favorite things. And uh, yes, my wife, myself and our puppy that we treat like a child are hanging out here in Southern California. So great to be here. Yeah, well, um, great to have you. And I'm excited to, to talk a little bit uh, about the things that you're doing. But before we dive into that, it'd be great if you could give everybody a little bit of context, a little bit of background for how you got to this point in your career. Absolutely. Um, I would say it's been uh, a couple of parts tenacity, a couple of parts uh, divine intervention, and uh, some strokes of luck along the way. I graduated college here in Southern California with a degree in business that uh, I fully intend on using at some point, but uh, found my way early on into the mortgage business. And uh, this was pre-2007, so the mortgage business was everywhere in Orange County and started with a small company working only in California. And by the time we were coming up on what would be the Great Recession, uh, ended up as the vice president of sales with 70 direct reports, 300,000 direct mail pieces a week, and just was, was having an absolute ball until the wheels came off. And that was sort of in a, my first inflection point in my career where it was like, my gosh, I, I'm, I'm an executive, great company, great comp, everything's going my way. You could have buried me under that desk and I would have been happy. And all of a sudden, everything changed. And the question was, what do I do now? And that's sort of what led me to this world of digital marketing. Um, I've been very, very fortunate that my path through digital marketing has been marked with some unbelievable mentors that I didn't even know well enough to choose at the outset, but I happened to find my way to them. And they really guided my path through this reinvention as going from a, a mortgage and finance executive to moving into executive leadership in software as a service, uh, digital education, and online marketing. And, you know, in my time in the online marketing world, I've had the pleasure of working with lots of amazing organizations. Um, some of the company names that you may remember, uh, Traffic Geyser, Mike Koenig's uh, working with Mike, uh, Glazer Kennedy, Insider Circle, Bill Glazer, Dan Kennedy. Um, previously had experience in the direct sales world with uh, a company called Empower Network at the time. And then software as a service uh, with Kajabi and, of course, also uh, time with Digital Marketer in, in Austin, Texas. So lots of a ver- varied executive career that touched on those different areas. And, man, it's just been an absolute blast. Yeah. And, um, I mean, you've worked with with really the, the who's who of, of the Internet marketing and direct marketing world. And, you know, the the interesting thing about your path is it's – you know, you maybe haven't been the one founding those firms, but you've come in and and played a, an important role. And for a lot of the folks who are listening, um, oftentimes we get, you know, we get the founder, the CEO listening, and they we, we find it again and again and again that they get to a point where they can't grow the business anymore. And they need that kind of outside perspective and outside talent. And um, and so having come in and fulfilled that role and, and helped really drive a lot of growth in these companies from your perspective, what, what is it? And where's the inflection point where somebody needs to be thinking about, Hey, I got to get, you know, some really high powered help in here so that we can add rocket fuel to what we've already got. You know, it's, it's interesting because I think that for a lot of entrepreneurs, that is one of the hardest questions to answer in any organization because you kind of have these diametrically opposed, very strong emotional pulls. You know, one side is I birthed this, I'm excited about this, and, and the idea of having anybody else 
in that vision or in that voice, uh, it can be intimidating. But on the other side, you will find that most entrepreneurs, some very early, some very late in the game, will begin to realize that their opportunities far exceed necessarily their core competencies, that their desire to go out and take every new hill and innovate and create and that early stage energy that they, they miss oftentimes results in them not falling in love with the activities of scale, you know, the the meetings, the processes, the standard operating procedures um, that for most successful entrepreneurs, most successful innovators could not be more mundane and boring. And um, I think, uh, you know, Reed Hoffman really did an amazing job encapsulating this where he talked about in technology the difference between startup and scale Mm -hmm. and the personality and proficiency that needs to be in scale as well well as in startup. And if you read the two of them side by side, they could not be more different. They couldn't be more um, opposite ends of the skill set spectrum. And so normally what I've found is, um, and you know, it's kind of a, I don't know if it's a statement I stole from somebody. If I did and they're listening, you know, please take credit. But you, you sort of end up in this position where, uh, you'll learn the same lesson in life in increasingly painful fashions Mm -hmm. until it's learned. And so it might be that very first time where the entrepreneur loses a key hire because they're tasking them with 342 hats and they only could handle 341. And they're like, you know what? This is crazy. I'm out. Mm -hmm. And that might be the first moment where that entrepreneur says, you know, I need specialization systems, org charts, you know, the kind of stuff that like they just have no desire to build. Right. Or it may be three, five, seven years down the line where the organization based on the entrepreneur's ability to sell and ability to enroll others in the excitement of that vision, it may have grown to a place where all of a sudden the complexity and the cacophony of the growth is so loud that they can't hear anything else. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, dear God, how did I get here? Where do I go from here? And what do I do with this giant organization that, you know, now people want to be managed and mentored. And I'm just like, what do I do? So it's, it's definitely different stages, different timelines, but I would say it really boils down to, that realization that there are opportunities as a founder I could capitalize on that I'm uniquely gifted to capitalize on if I had somebody else to take care of the running of the thing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, coming in the the way that, that you have mm-hmm. done repeatedly, that's got to take some, some skill. I mean, it, you're coming into somebody else's baby, right? And taking over some of what they do and making decisions that they used to make. Um, I, I imagine that that takes a special kind of diplomacy to be able to pull off. How, how do you approach that? Well, I find that from my from my experience, there have been two different experiences that I've had coming into companies. Um, you are either coming into a company that really has a lot of amazing systems identified and growth levers identified, and it's a process of pulling them more rapidly and essentially throwing gasoline on a fire and taking it to the next level in an organized fashion. The other side of it is you're coming into an organization that has tremendous potential, but maybe by virtue of not a real managed approach to growth, you've got a lot of cleanup to do. You've got a lot of reorganizing to do. You've got a lot of the what got us here is not going to get us there. And you're brought in as the guy that it's like, hey, um, I've been arm in arm with these people or these processes for a long time. I need somebody to come in and help me get rid of some of the things that I might not be ready to get rid of or reinvent. Mm -hmm. So the the diplomacy side for me has always been, number one, a tremendous amount of empathy you know, really being able to appreciate and understand the journey that that entrepreneur has been on, as well as the uh, the empathy needed for the team that they have amassed. Because depending on how hard driving that entrepreneur is, you may have a team that is just like desperate for a breath of fresh air because they've been going a million miles a minute with their hair on fire for so long. Mm-hmm. So empathy and understanding those circumstances is going to be a very significant portion of what allows you to build rapport and and have the buy-in from an organization that will allow you to make cool things happen. 
The other side of it is certainly being crystal clear on how we will judge what success means with whomever is bringing me into the equation. Because if I'm being brought into something, whether it's amazing and we need to scale it to amazing times three, or I'm being brought into something that has tremendous potential, but right now it's a mess, how we judge what success looks like is crucial because you always have this critical moment in any relationship where you're being brought in as a high level executive where you will have to either disagree or ask for someone to trust you because you're doing things that are new, different, or are outside of their realm of familiarity. And if you have success defined and you agree that that's where you're pointing to, there may come a time where it's like, look, we both know where we're going. We both know the goal in getting there. But there's some things I'm going to need to do that as long as we agree on the outcome, you kind of have to let me own the middle. And that part of it has been, you know, pretty significantly important. Because if you don't define success the right way, all of a sudden it becomes a micromanaging crazy fest of how to get to the outcome, which just gums up the works and slows everything down. Yeah, I would imagine so. I mean, in almost every case, I would think that's the, the reason you're being brought in is is your particular skill set at, at sort of being able to take the 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 entrepreneur, the founder, out of the micromanaging mess, right, and and be able to now put some some very important structure in place in in this fast growing kind of entrepreneurial business. And so, uh, but you know, having worked with an awful lot of business founders. I will tell you that most of them desperately resist any kind of, you know, imposition of structure, particularly on themselves, because they want to be the freedom to be able to go and create. So um, it sounds like a, a one of the more challenging tasks in business. I mean, you're coming at this real inflection point in the growth of a company. Lots of stuff going on. The only reason you're there is because they've had enough success to warrant having somebody there. And, uh, and now you've got to sort of rebuild the company to go to the next level. And that can't be an easy thing to do. Well, and, and the other thing too that I would say just from a, a qualitative perspective that has always served me well is I've always been a very pragmatic individual. That my goal in any organization that I'm coming into is always to expand and amplify the founder and their vision. And it's something that in any company you will have to really walk that line of not not having, you know, you'll find executives at times that have secret ambitions of I want to be the front guy. I I want to be the, you know, I want to be the visionary. I want to be the founder. Um, and that's something for me that I've always been fortunate that that's never really been a huge focus of mine. That, you know, I've always been very, very happy to be driving the outcomes I'm driving, building the teams I'm building. But as it relates to being the the guy on stage or the, you know, vision aspect, the name aspect, those are things that I've always really felt are best served left to the founder and entrusted to them. And also it helps tremendously being able to build rapport that if you're working with an exec, if you're working with a founder that has a passion for stuff like that, they have a very real risk where you're coming into something and they're probably wondering, you know, are you going to replace that role that I play? Mm -hmm. Do they want you to replace that role? You know, do it, Hey, do you, do you want to be the guy speaking? Do you want to be the guy selling? Do you want to be the guy writing books and on podcasts? Or is that something you would like me to do? You'd like me to assist with, you'd like me to replace um, that aspect of, again, defining success, but also in my particular case, not really having a desire for, for the stage and for the front man presence, I think has also been very helpful in having the, the threat of a new person coming in and touching a, a machine that's running significantly reduced. Yeah. And I think, um, fantastic answer, by the way. And I think, uh, for everybody listening, I, with anybody that you're working with to the extent that you can get clear on what success looks like. And, and I don't, you know, it's funny. I find that so many uh, people in business, whether you're the business owner or you're an executive in a, in a company that we leave that step out and we, we tend to leave that step out or leave it a little bit gray 
because sometimes it's hard to get to that place. You got to have some some really challenging conversations at times um, and get real with things. But um, but when you do, you I think you you risk so much. Uh, makes it just very difficult to go forward and, and operate authentically. So, uh, Jonathan, thanks for sharing all that. We're going to be right back. I can't wait to hear what you're working on now. And uh, hang on, we'll be right back with more from Jonathan Cronstead. Hi, this is Steve. I hope you're enjoying this interview. We've got more to come in a minute. But what I'd love for you to do right now is rate this podcast. Leave us a review. Rate us on iTunes. It'll really help others discover the podcast and help us help other CEOs, other business leaders become unstoppable. So if you go to unstoppableceo.net, forward slash iTunes. You can find instructions there and links that will take you right to where you need to go to review the podcast. Thanks so much. Now back to the interview. Hey, welcome back to the podcast. This is Steve Gordon and I'm talking with Jonathan Cronstead of Kajabi. And uh, Jonathan, um, I know you guys have a ton going on and I'm just, I'm excited to, to hear what you're excited about. What's, what's happening right now and, um, and, and what can you share with us? Well, thanks for the opportunity, Steve. And uh, by all means, please call me Jay Cron. Anybody listening, if they hear the name Jonathan Cronstead, they definitely won't know who it is. Mm. Um, but it's certainly something over at Kajabi. We've just got some unbelievable things going on right now. And uh, I would actually even say the industry and the trend lines for the, the world that we operate in have just never been more exciting. Um, we've really uh, gotten very clear on, on who we are, what we do. And the term that we've wrapped around it is this idea of knowledge commerce. Um, this idea of looking at the different ages that the world has gone through of, you know, your industrial age, the agricultural, uh, sorry, agricultural age, agrarian age, industrial age, information age. And now what we are moving into is what we believe is the knowledge age. Um, the information uh the information age really didn't deliver on the promises that we expected. You know, we were all told that technology was going to solve all of our issues. The Internet was going to make everything easy and accessible. But really, all it's done is give us more overwhelm, more disinformation and more burden to look at more options that we always feel incapable of deciding between. And we believe that knowledge commerce is the answer to that. And Kajabi really is designed to equip someone who has knowledge to offer it to the rest of the world for profit or for whatever motives they have and be able to do it without all of the technology headaches. Um, you know, if you wanted to offer an online course or sell your information a decade ago, you would have had to have five, ten platforms cobbled together and a whole bunch of different things that, you know, really put you in the place of being a technologist, not someone who just had knowledge that wanted to offer it to the world. And so what we've really tried to do is continue to ask the question of how can we make technology easier and more accessible, but also equip entrepreneurs that may want to either not retire, but rewire and have a new business based on their life experience, or young people entering the workforce that would prefer to choose an entrepreneurial path rather than a cubicle position, or individuals that have an amazing business and would like to add another income stream by teaching others what they do and how they do it. Regardless of the category, we want to be the platform of choice that makes it easy for them to accomplish those goals. And what we're most excited about is if you look at the Intuit Insights 2020 report, uh, the trend lines for 3 billion new consumers coming online between now and 2020 that have never had access to any of the things that we largely in the United States take for granted. Um, it's an exciting time to be offering your knowledge online and connecting with a global audience, much like you know what you're doing here, Steve, with the technology to have a podcast with global reach, all from the comfort of your own home. Absolutely. So, you know, it seems like you you can hardly throw a rock on the internet now and not hit somebody who's selling you know their knowledge, their 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 new online course. We've seen just a proliferation of of these offerings over the last you know really the last probably three to five years. Do you feel like we're heading to a, a place where there's too much of it? There's, um, you know, where it's saturated? Great question. Um, if you're looking at the course through the lens of a hammer is a hammer is a hammer, then definitely the view of saturation is going to be the one that looks most prominent. You know, how many courses can we really have on Google AdWords? 
Now, the side that I would come from with that is actually the amount of individual consumers that are seeking connection, not simply information. Because the reality of it is there's more than enough information out there that is free, available, but it doesn't come with the connection, the personality, and the ability to say, I want to learn from that person, which is always answered before I want to learn whatever they're teaching me. Um, it's really something where I think there may be, you know, too many AdWords courses out there right now from just learning the act of putting ads on Google. But I think that there is still more than enough room tomorrow to launch an AdWords course specifically for uh, vegan chefs or specifically for CrossFit instructors or specifically for um, gothic music. Uh, you know, there's there's always a specialization. There's always a uniqueness. There's always a personality that can be added that completely changes the addressable market. Um, I think that we definitely also have the benefit of those three billion new consumers that I talked about coming online that have never purchased anything before. So for us, it may be, you know, we, we've already been down that road, but for them, this is all new and all fresh. And I also think even if you look at the, the paradox of choice, um, we live in a world today where hyper-individualism is important. You know, I don't want the same iPhone case that everybody else has. I don't want the same clothing. I don't want, you know, I don't want the same brands, whereas, you know, in suburbia, you know, post-World War II, you had like three brands to choose from, if that, and all three of those brands were equally appropriate, whereas today, you've got hundreds, thousands, millions sometimes of choices, and those choices become reflections of your individuality. So I think, uh, I think it's something that we've only seen the beginning of how many versions of how many things to learn that are, are going to be brought to market. Well, I, I think you make um, a very important point around relationship and you know if even if you go back let's say before before this online revolution where education has really moved um, to the internet and you go back let let's go back i don't know pick a time 30 years 50 years to where the primary mode of education at least at a higher level was through universities we you know those of us who were going to a university had our preferences based on whatever connection we may have had with that institution, whether it be with the brand or the image that we perceived or some other affiliation. And, and I think that drove a lot of choices. So it, it may not be as as new and different a decision as as it feels like. Um, and I think that to your point, um, I think there are lots of opportunities now for people to get in and, and build relationship with a group of people and then offer them something. And I, I know it's talked about a lot, but uh, I have seen over the last year more and more people come out and, and you know, write these these uh, epistles on why they think online education is dead. And, and uh, it, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for, uh, you know, for your perspective on that. Well, and I think a couple of other pieces of that. I mean, you know, first of all, the, the easiest, you know, easiest way to generate interest in any market is go in, take whatever is the popular trend and say it's dead. You know, direct mail is dead. Television advertising is dead. Radio is dead. You know, all of these things that marketers use to gather attention when in reality, even still to this day, direct mail is a giant business and probably is the single largest aspect of charitable donations and, and political activism. So, uh, you know, for, for the medium that has been declared dead so many times, it's still the most effective and gigantic. So anytime anybody says to me, oh, this is dead, it's like, well, really? <laughs> I mean, you know, look five, ten years ago, it was, oh my gosh, iTunes killed the music business, but yet the most profitable music category last year, vinyl records. You right. know, it's uh, in a book called Revenge of the Analog and talking about all of these businesses that digital had pronounced dead that <laughs> aren't really dead and are actually doing quite well. So I think uh, in that case, the most expensive information you can get is bad information. And uh, I think that it's one of those things that anytime you have anybody telling you something is dead ask what that person's motivation is mm -hmm. for telling you that it's dead. Um, you know, go back to Karl Marx and, you know, see, see whom is to benefit um, from that information. But I also think, too, it's, it's born out of this um, paradigm of how we learn. And, you know, when you look at the ballooning student loan debt crisis that is no longer translating to predictable earnings, 
um, how are we going to educate people when they decide they don't want to go to college? You know, how are we going to educate people when they are not plugging into the traditional systems that other generations have seen as the only way to do things? You know, how, how are we going to equip this generation of entrepreneurs that maybe doesn't want to be location specific in their career pursuits? Um, there, there are so many trend lines that indicate that this idea of learning what I want to learn, when I want to learn it, how I want to learn it, and from whom I want to learn it, I have to imagine those trend lines to me are far more powerful. And I also think, too, the idea of even saturation and what's on right now that people are looking at largely is a logical argument. Like, oh, well, you know, there's already a course on that, so I'm not going to make another one. But the reality of it is we are not logical beings as much as we would love to assume we are. We're irrational. You know, how we make decisions is far more emotionally motivated than it is logically motivated. If it weren't the case, there wouldn't be 800 brands of toothpaste. I don't know if that's a real quote. I made that number up. But, I mean... If, if all it was was the logical need of, I need to clean my teeth, there'd only be one toothpaste, mm. but there isn't. There's a bajillion toothpastes because nobody buys toothpaste logically. Um, so I think that that lens can be applied to any industry and say, we are absolutely always going to see people that know how to market, know how to meet the needs of that market, going to be successful, regardless mm. of how crowded the market is. You know, everyone said flip phones are dead, but yet... Jitterbug launched a flip phone is doing massively well in an area where everyone said the smartphone was the only thing everyone would have. Um, yeah, that's just kind of my take on, uh, is it saturated? Is there opportunity? And, uh, you know, Hey, I mean, I, I guess I would say on, on behalf of myself, our growing company and our growing user base, if, uh, if you think it's dead, it just leaves a lot more room for us to take advantage of it. So, yeah. Uh, that's great. So what are some of the innovative things you guys are seeing people do in online learning, particularly on your platform? What are some of the unique ways that, that they're using it to, uh, you know, to build a business and to reach out and, and impact an audience? You know, I think they're building much more impactful and immersive educational experiences than you get in a one-size-fits-all academic institution. Um, you know, you could go to college today for marketing, and you're going to walk out of there, and by the time you're done with college, everything you learned is likely outdated. Uh, I mean, Facebook's marketing algorithms change so quickly that it's even challenging to rebuild video courses on online advertising. So I see our user base doing not only an amazing job of staying on the cutting edge of the areas that they're passionate about, the you know things they want to evangelize, the professions that they gleaned their knowledge from. But also, I see them educating in a very different way. It's not, I'm just going to expand this because the school year is nine months. It's, I can teach you this topic in three and a half hours with relevant exercises, and I can skip all of the things that on my journey didn't serve me. So the effectiveness quotient of what you learn goes way up. And as technology and our development team, who I'm very proud of, has improved, the immersiveness and the effectiveness of that approach goes up even further. That now you can even watch you know, video lessons at uh, one and a half to two times the speed and be able to consume that information that much faster. You're able to build in assessments and um, you know, quiz and interact with people uh, along the way. You're able to answer comments below a video that are in context. So rather than having someone go through an entire course, you can answer questions in that moment based on that information and then have an entire community benefit from that question being asked and that question being answered in that context. You know, imagining like, for example, if you were going through a college course on marketing, how beneficial would it be that right before you went through the college semester, you got all of the questions and you got all of the answers all along the way so mm -hmm. that you now knew you were equipped to ask better questions. Um, it's just really a, a wholesale reevaluation of how we learn and the technology really making it more impactful in less time and equipping people to get back to doing what they want to do anyway. Yeah. You know, um, we've come an awfully long way from the three ring binder wrapped in cellophane that gets shipped to your door as as being the, the way that we're educated outside of, of traditional institutions. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we do some of that for our, our clients and 
uh, I'm amazed at what can be accomplished now uh, through these methods. And, and, uh, and it's useful both for the clients and it's certainly useful uh, as a business owner. I, when we went to, uh, you know, to begin to offer some of this stuff, I was doing consulting and found myself having the same conversations with people again and again and again. And we started capturing that in video. And it turns out the clients like that better because they could get it anytime they want. And, um, and so I think there's tremendous advantage, uh, to, you know, to this approach. So just give folks a sense. So if somebody's listening and they haven't thought before about maybe packaging up their knowledge and, and offering it, um, give, give us a sense for what that looks like for a business owner who hasn't been down the road before. How difficult is it today? And what are some of the things they should think about? Sure. So uh, we at Kajabi definitely come from the framework in this burgeoning knowledge commerce world that everybody knows something of value, whether it is your ability as an early stage entrepreneur to have a passion for something you want to learn, distill that knowledge down into something actionable that's specific and teach others, i.e., you know, you may learn all the things to know about marketing online and distill that down into a small course for chiropractors on how to build a local presence within their market. You also have that avatar of someone who might be mid-stage in their career and thinking to themselves, you know, gosh, I've been uh, a dentist for over a decade and a half, and I see that my industry doesn't talk about how to naturally fight cavities and avoid drilling. I really would like to educate other dentists on how to do that and build, you know, a secondary income stream in that regard. And the third avatar is the person who's looking at, you know, retiring and either saying, A, I would love to not just retire and have my knowledge uh, decay and, you know, be essentially become useless, or I'm retiring and I'm not capitalized to retire the way I would like to, and I'd love to supplement my lifestyle. Um, I think of one of our guys, uh, Dean uh, Mangione. He spent his life as an interviewer for firefighters. You know, he basically did nothing but interview firefighters that were, uh, you know, applying for all the firefighter stations in his district. And he realized all of a sudden that all of these guys wanted to be firefighters, but none of them knew how to interview to be a firefighter. And here's a guy who spent his lifetime interviewing firefighters. And so he put together a course for firefighters on, hey, here's how to nail the interview. And, you know, now he and his wife are retired. You know, they take his motorcycle all over the U.S. and he pops into hotels to check his email, make sure the course is online, do the live Q&A. So I would say regardless of what area you're in, you can package either knowledge you would like to have, you can package knowledge that you've developed, or you can package knowledge that you've amassed and offer that to the marketplace. And the biggest suggestion I could offer is definitely don't complicate it. This is certainly an industry where there are so many great topics that could be and should be covered that never get covered because people are still waiting for dropping 20 pounds to look good on camera or getting the lighting (laughs) just right or being worried about the sound quality or wondering if they're going to be judged or if all of their friends are going to laugh at them. You know, people literally think that the moment you put something on the internet, the entire globe is instant Instantly aware of it, paying rapt attention, and they are going to make fun of every flaw you have, when in reality, it couldn't be further from the truth. Mm -hmm. People want the same thing. They want authenticity, they want connection, and they want impact for the goals that they have. If you can provide those three things, regardless of the topic, whether it be passion, profession, proficiency, whatever you want to teach, there's an audience out there that is waiting for you specifically with your experience to teach it to them. You know, maybe it's Uh, Maybe it's personal training from someone who actually at one time was out of shape rather than walking into a gym and meeting someone that looks like they've never been out of shape and can't relate to what it's like to being out of shape. Um, There's innumerable examples. I mean, we even have things, Steve, as crazy as horse ballet. Like uh, it's called dressage. It's when you teach horses to trot in different ways. We have people teaching courses like that on Kajabi. I mean, literally horse ballet. I can't think of something that more people would be like, nobody wants to know what I know. And it's like, ha horse ballet, successful <laughs> horse. So uh, I would say you're only limited by your creativity and your willingness to work. And you're only limited by your ability to just get going because we really are living in an age where the technology barriers have all been removed. Yeah. And, and you guys have done a good job of that. Um, and I can say that as, as a, a customer and having used it for the last couple of years and, um, and Jay Cron, I'm so grateful that you've been on. Uh, you've got a great story to tell, very unique story. 
And uh, what, what's the best place for people to go and, and find more about you and, and more about Kajabi? Oh, thank you so much. Well, uh, they can hit me up, you know, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, Twitter is at the Jcron, uh, T-H-E-J-C-R-O-N, or, uh, you know, any anywhere they find me, they can reach me. Um, you know, being the the dutiful executive, I'm I'm far more plugged in and work far more often than I should. Um, you know, I'm one of those quality of life guys that you know I try to optimize processes so that I can work more with the time I create. So would love to connect with anybody. And uh, Steve, really appreciate you having me on the show. I think it's such a unique uh, unique split of really getting the the inside game of, you know, how you got here, what has served you, and then also talking about the the general business, what's working now and what's out there in the marketplace. I've, I've had an absolute blast. Hey, thanks so much for being here. Look forward to connecting again soon. <laughs> Take care, Steve. Thanks for listening to the Unstoppable CEO Podcast. Help others discover this show. Leave a review and rating on iTunes at unstoppableceo.net forward slash iTunes.